Good morning, GSA Sunday School class. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I pray each and every one of you had a blessed and prosperous Christmas, that you spent time with your family and friends and loved ones, for Jesus is truly the reason for the season. May we have a word of prayer. Eternal wise Father, Lord, we come before you thanking you and praising you for just who you are, Lord God. Father God, we just ask that you continue to fall fresh on us, Lord God. Continue to open our hearts and our minds as we study your word, Father. Father God, we just ask right now that you look over our pastor right now, Lord God. Continue to keep him covered. Lord God, bless his family right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We ask that you bless the greater St. John family as a whole, Lord God, and continue to keep us covered under your almighty shadow. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Once again, I do pray everybody had a blessed and prosper Christmas. This morning's Sunday school lesson is coming out of the book of Nahum. It's not too much said about Nahum. He um, man of prophet. It's only three chapters in the book of Nahum. But I posed a question because I was thinking about it because when you study Nahum, you, you really know what it's going to get into. Have you ever asked or thought about how is it that those that are do, do you wrong or those that are coming up against you, how they go unpunished? It seems like those are the type of people that are the ones that are prospering more than those that are faithful into God. And it and then we ask, why does it seem like God don't punish them? But here in today's lesson, God does not let the evildoers go unpunished. Today's lesson comes from Nahum, one of the minor prophets. Like I said, very little is known about Nahum, just that he was a minor prophet. He's not spoken about in any other books of the Bible. But Nahum's prophecy was directed to the people of Nineveh and indirectly to the people of Judah. Nahum prophecy is a twofold one. One, to deliver the message of judgment and destruction to Nineveh, and two is to give comfort to Judah. And he's giving comfort to Judah because the, uh, the Assyrians um, had captured them, and since they had captured them and God has doomed, there was no longer going to be a threat until the people of Judah. Judah sorry. Here we're back at Nineveh where some 100 years ago, God was gonna destroy this city once again. So he picked the prophet, Jonah. We all know the story of Jonah and the well. Jonah was to go preach against the wicked ways that they was doing. But as we can recall, Jonah didn't, have, didn't wanna have anything to do with these people because he knew their reputation. Jonah, know, Jonah knew that they was wicked. He knew they was some killers. They were some all outright thugs. And he knew that God was merciful. And he knew that if he had went to teach and preach what God had sent him for, that by God being so merciful, merciful that he would forgive them, which is not all wrong because each and every one of us want God to forgive us and have his grace and mercy fall upon us for the things that we have done in our life. If we can recall that Jonah did everything to try to keep from going. He even ran from God. And we all know you cannot run and hide from the Lord. He ran from God. He he, he went to the city of Tarsus where he got on a ship. You know, where he, where he went to Joppa to go to Tarsus where he got on the ship trying to run from the Lord. And God caused a great wind to come upon the sea and started a storm where it threatened to tear the boat apart that he was on and then finally he confessed to the people and said if you want to survive he had wanted the people to survive that he would have to get off the ship so they had threw Jonah overboard they cast him away and God had commanded a fish a whale to swallow up Jonah and he stayed in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights and God had commanded the whale to spit him out on dry land and when he spit him out on dry land it was only then that Jonah agreed to go to Nineveh to preach what thus says the Lord and so many times we have to go we try to run from the Lord and we realize that we cannot all it is is when God tells us to do something we should just really go and go through it because we don't want him to cause his wrath to fall on us for us being disobedient and not listening to him Now, Jonah finally did. He went and he went to Nineveh and he preached what thus said the Lord. And the good thing about it was, guess what? They listened. The people listened and they turned from their wicked ways and they repented 
unto God, saying, I will never turn back to those ways. Jonah was not happy about that. Jonah rather see them destroyed than giving back to the Lord and God have grace and mercy on them. But after studying and reading that hymn, I kind of understand why Jonah was a little upset and preferred God to go ahead and destroy him. It brings us to Nahum. Nahum. Nahum was also told to go to Nineveh to preach. But this time, it was for the judgment and destruction of them. Because once again, after a hundred years, guess what? They resulted right back to what they repented and turned from. And so many times, that's why God turns us, this turns us over to what it is that we was doing and then we don't understand why he he punishes us for what we have done and he sent Nahum to do that guess what I'm not going to give you a second chance I've already gave you that this is what you want to do so therefore this is what I'm going to have to do so today's Sunday school lesson comes from Nahum chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 verses 6 through 8 verses 12 and 13 and verse 15 I will begin reading a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, an apple shot. The Lord is a jealous and avengeful God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storms and clouds are in the dust of his people. Verse 6. Who can withstand the indignation? Who can endure the fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in time of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Verse 12. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and passed away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. Verse 15. Look, there are the mountains, the feet of who brings good news, who proclaim peace. Celebrate your fest of Judah and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you they will be completely destroyed. Today's key text is verse two. The Lord is a jealous and avengeful God. The Lord takes vengeance and is full with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. So as we get into the Sunday school lesson, chapter one, verse one, it says a prophecy concerning Nineveh. Prophets often begins their prophecies using a word that can be translated like burden. Examples, Isaiah 13, 1 and Zechariah 9 and 1. The same word is also translated inspired utterance. In Proverbs 30, 1 and 31 and 1, the prophecy that follows is often one of judgment and that, it, and that is the case here. This is the weightly call not a trouble or light matter. The city of Nimr was located on the Tyrus River, site of present-day Iraq. Nineveh was first mentioned in the Bible when a descendant of Noah's sons, Ham, built it. The second, 1b, the book of the vision of Nahum and the Appleshite. The vision is another way to fulfill the prophecy being revealed in the book. The same Hebrew word can also be translated Revelation. This can be found Proverbs 29 and 18, Habakkuk 2, chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, which emphasizes that God provides both an experience and the wisdom to understand its significance. Nahum means repenting or compassion. He is the only person in the Old Testament with that name, and it's not and it's not the Nahum named in Jesus' genealogy. Nahum did not provide the names of his ancestors, only that he was from a town called Alkash. Here, Jonah and Nahum are the two Old Testament prophets whose prophecy focused on coming judgment on Nineveh. 
Nahum's prophecy differs from Jonah's in two key ways. First, Nahum was told to preach in Judah about Nineveh, not in Nineveh itself. And two, Nahum's prophecy was fulfilled. Jonah was unfulfilled because God chose mercy over judgment when the people repented. We can find this in Jonah 3, 6 through 10, Matthew 12 and 41. Zephaniah, a contemporary of Nahum, also named Nineveh in the context of judgment coming to the Assyria. We can find that in Zephaniah 2 through 13. In verse 2, it says, The punish for my foes. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against the enemies. We should take care to understand what it means for the Lord to be jealous. God's jealousy is not like that of humans. It's not that of if I see my girlfriend talking to another guy, I'm going to get upset. The biblical concept of jealousy is when applied to God indicates a profound sense of caring and commitment. This is even more apparent where a word in the original language is translated jealousy in one passage, but zeal in another. For example, the Hebrew noun translated jealousy in Ezekiel 8 and 3, 5 and Zechariah 8 and 2 is rendered zeal in Isaiah. In the New Testament, the Greek noun translated jealousy in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2 is the same one translated zeal in Philippians 3 and 6. A overlap in meaning is affirmed in English by dictionary entry that offers the meaning of jealousy as a zealous of zealous. The common ideal is one of fierce. In this verse, God's jealousy is more closely linked to his protecting his people from violence and oppression than often results with hostile nations worship violent and oppressive false gods. We can find this in, oh, I'm sorry, Sennacherib, an Assyrian king during the time of Hezekiah's reign. Learn this lesson the hard way. In 701 BC, Zechariah had captured many citizens in Judah. So the Lord protecting both his name and his people struck the Assyrian army and 185,000, I'm sorry, 185,000 soldiers died in one night. Repetition in Hebrew prophecy, which was often written as poetry, serves to emphasize the point of being made. In this verse, God's vengeance and wrath become more frightened and immediate through Nahum's insistence that God will act out on the righteous rage. Verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. If the nation of Assyrian deserved to be punished, why had God not done something earlier? God waits patiently because he wants everyone to repent. He does not wish for anyone to perish. God does not react in haste. That's why it's so important that no matter what we do in this life, that we trust God for all things. When we know that we've done wrong, and even when we don't know we're doing wrong, and mainly that comes when we think things, guess what? We should ask God for forgiveness. You should ask God for forgiveness on a daily basis. Lord, forgive me for my sins that I did. You know you did. Forgive me for the things that I did not do. You know, Lord, forgive me for the things that I thought. We always want God to forgive us, and we want to ask for that forgiveness because we don't want to get to heaven one day and he said you didn't ask for forgiveness you didn't repent you didn't turn from your wicked ways so it's always a good thing to try to be the best we can be turn from the those we say wicked them gossiping of uh, being nasty you know talking down on one another you know discouraging one some, someone we should really get away from that and know that god is patience but sometimes his patience does run out but god's patience does have its limits <laughs> And when, when his patience ends, he still has the power to hold the guilty accountable. The people of Noah's day had gone too far from God and acted wickedly. So God sent a flood and we all know what happened. He destroyed the earth. Having promised never to destroy the whole world with water again, God still reserved the right to act in judgment. Although God acts as a judge, 
this verse describes him as more of a righteous warrior. Compare Revelations 19, 11 through 16. Unlike human fighters, he has the nature at his command as, as his weapons. The whirlwinds from forms in the sky and reaches to earth. The storm can yield thunder and lightning, hail, destructive rains, and more. Clouds, prayer, I'm sorry, clouds parallel these terms and encompass weather more generally. Not only does God command these, but but they are as distressing to him as the dust that keeps us up as he walks in heavens. That is to say, not at all. Verse 6. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce, fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The recognition of the Lord's power caused Nahum to ask two rhetorical questions. These are the same things and in doing so emphasize the impossibility to answer. No one can withstand God's indignation and his fierce anger. No person, no nation, no power, not even the strongest of the strongest, strongest will has the ability to resist God. God's wrath is like a volcano. Lava like fire is poured out. The eruption sends rocks into the air. Nothing in the path of a volcano or the Lord in his righteous anger can survive. Any resistance is futile. Verse 7. Protection for his people. The Lord is good, his refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. All of God's many attributes are tempered by the fact that he is good. He created good things. He gives good gifts. Those who trust in him experience his goodness and protection from harm. The phrase he cares for those anticipates Jesus' self-disclosure, that he is the good shepherd who knows his sheep and cares for them. That's John 10, 14 through 15. And on the Lord as its refuge, compare Psalms 21, 2, I'm sorry, 31, 2, in contrast, 52 and 7. So we, we do know God is good. We, we thank God for his goodness. We thank God for his grace and his mercy. And we thank God for him to look over us each and every day. So we know that he is a good God. And that's why we should be obedient to him and to his word. Verse 8. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make a no end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Nahum often used poetic images to describe Nineveh's destruction, but two factors here were literally fulfilled. The Tigris River ran along the western side of Nineveh, and a tributary from the east joint joined it there. A severe flooding in both rivers at once would be too much for the foundation of the mighty city. During the Babylonian siege on Nineveh, an overwhelming flood, flood occurred that damaged the walls of the city and that helped to bring about the end of the great city. After that, the figurative flood of Babylon, the Babylonians, Medes, took the city. Many ancient cities suffered capture and destruction and new cities were built on top of the ruins, but Nineveh was never rebuilt. Figurative darkness also overwhelmed Nineveh. There is no ind indication that God used the same darkness in Nineveh as he chose in Egypt. Rather, the, fat, the fate of the city was similar to what was believed of the dead person existing in some dark places. Never be offered opportunity to enter God's presence. Still, darkness playing a part in releasing God's people from oppression. Verse 12. This is what the Lord says is a phrase used hundreds of times in the Old Testament with some variations to introduce a, pro a prophecy given by God. What is revealed about Nineveh would happen as surely as if it had already happened. The prophecy was entirely trustworthy. The people of Nineveh would foolishly behave as though they were secure as a result of those political alliances of natural strength. I think that's what happens to us in today's society. We believe to a certain extent that God will reign his wrath, but then to a certain extent we don't believe 
That's why so many are still doing the same things they've been doing, you know, year after year, you know, decade after decade, because they're really unsure that will, will he really do it? It's, it's almost like we're testing God to do. Let, let me see what you really do. And in so many times, like you, like in this lesson this morning, all we have to do is read it, read the word. And guess what? It tells us, guess what? I'm not going to play with y'all all the time. And you got to realize God is not a play toy. You know, you go play with the toys at, at, at Walmart, but don't play with God. He is not to be played with. Verse 12b, although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. The subject of God's address changes here from Assyria to Judah. Assyria, the instrument of God's anger, had gone too far and would be stopped. We can find that in Isaiah 10, 5 through 7. The Assyrians violence and oppress would not have would not afflict God's people forever. That's good news. Verse 13. Peace for his people. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. Oh, God is setting them free. You know, it's a great thing to be set free by the Lord. A wooden yoke was placed on the neck of animals for pulling heavy loads or plowing. While it was a mere tool on a beast of burden, people were never meant to bear that kind of yoke in view here. The yoke therefore became a symbol of oppression. Assyrian bondage of Judah would end. The Lord spoke once again to Nivea in Nahum 1 and 14. Even though this is not printed in our text, his declaration left no doubt as to the fate of the city is false gods. Verse 15. Look there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news. The opening words of this verse are similar to those of Isaiah 52 and 7, which itself is quoted in Romans 10 and 15. In Isaiah's, con Isaiah's context, the good news was the Babylonian exile would end and the people of Judah would be restored to their land. For the Apostle Paul, the words of Romans find their ultimate meaning in the march of the news regarding Jesus Christ. For Nahum and pre-Babylonian Judah, the good news was the Assyrians would fall. Who proclaims peace? Peace had been a blessing available to the people in the promised land if they remain faithful to the Lord. And it is so important for us to remain faithful to everything that we do in God. So many times we get caught up in a man or a woman of God where when things seem to happen, you know, we tumble and fall. It's not about that. It's about the upbuilding of God's kingdom. You have to be faithful in doing what God has called you to do. It's not about man, but it's truly about God. The peace was so included Corporations from the land of aquaculture, victory over foes. The most important, importantly, God's presence in short reversal of the curses found in Genesis 3. This too is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Celebrate your festive Judah and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. As a result, Nahum challenged Judah to celebrate the various festivals prescribed in the law of Moses. This implication is, the, is that some type of restriction had hindered and free exercise of the ship for the people of God or more troubling to the people hadn't been very dedicated to their celebration to begin with, with and had used foreign interference as an excuse not to fulfill their vows. With the destruction of the wicked, however, the people would be free once again to choose devotion to God and enjoy blessings that came with it. So sometimes in life we do get it, we do get caught up in what is holding us down, but we can always reassure that God will set us free. For those that are free in Jesus is free indeed. The good news, the destruction of Nimrod fulfilled Nahum's prophecy. The city's destruction was complete. And so too, so too was the end of Assyria's dominance. The pending doom of Nivea was the greatest part of Nahum's prophecy, but closely related was the word of deliverance for Judah. This comforted the people who had been oppressed by Assyrians for decades. Injustice still exists, and God still intends to act and bring justice and deliver his people, but he sees the global picture so his timetable differs from what we might desire. In his treatment of Assyria, he did not act in haste. 
At the right time in God's plan, the nation of Assyria came to an end. If he had fulfilled his purpose, God's justice prevailed. God's timing is always perfect. Never forget that God's timing is always perfect. Let us pray. God in heaven, help us to shape our lives, to show that we truly believe that you are holy, just, and loving. Today, we especially thank you for forgiving us, forgiving us your son. In his name we pray. Amen.